Welcome everyone to the inaugural Wenger Family Lecture on International Business and Finance at GW's Elliott School of International Affairs in Washington, DC. I'm James Foster, Elliott School Vice Dean, Professor of Economics, and the Oliver T. Carr Professor of International Affairs. I'm glad you're here today for today's special conversation with Jim Quigley, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, entitled From the Elliott School to Global Finance Leader. This is a great day for the Elliott School of International Affairs and for me personally, as it represents the culmination of two and a half years of effort to make it happen. Yes, we are still emerging from the pandemic and much of our audience is online, but we are so excited to be here in person at the Elliott School. Today's event is also significant to the Elliott School uh, in that it signals the centrality of international economic policy to international affairs and reflects the fact that more than 30% of our graduates take up careers in the private sector. And with preeminent faculty like Graciela Kaminsky, Jay Shambaugh in the field of international finance, we are sure to continue this trajectory. The Elliott School is grateful to the Henry E. and Consuelo S. Wenger Foundation for its generous support. And in particular, would like to thank Caprice Wenger Baum for her role in creating the Wenger Family Lecture at the Elliott School. I, I understand you're joining us today by Zoom from Seattle, uh, along with your daughter, Wellesley Parker. So welcome to the event and thank you for all you've done. You've done. I also want to thank the Institute for International Economic Policy and Director Jay Shambaugh for its co-sponsorship of today's event. I'm now pleased to present Elliott School alumna, Wellesley Parker, a member of the Wenger family, to introduce our guest speaker and moderator. Wellesley has spent her career focused on national security and international trade regulatory compliance. She is currently a senior trade compliance project manager at Amazon in Seattle. Previously, she worked at PwC in their export controls and trade sanctions practice group. Wellesley has graduate degrees from American universities, Washington College of Law, the London School of Economics, and has an undergraduate degree from the Elliott School. At Elliott, Wellesley focused on international politics and international development, interned at the State Department, studied abroad at Spain and Argentina, and during law school, Wellesley focused on international trade law and interned at the Department of Commerce and the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. As I said before, Wellesley is joining us from Seattle. Welcome, Wellesley. The virtual podium is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today. It's a pleasure to be here I'm with sorry. you all. Oh, oh. Okay. So this is one part that I need to, do you know what I'm trying to do, Kyle? You're doing it right. Okay, but I want to spotlight her. Yeah, the yep. view Perfect. speaker. Yeah. I'm Yay! There we go. Okay, that's good. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, again, um, thank you, Vice Dean Foster, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's wonderful to be here at the Elliott School today. Uh, initially, when I was a new student at GW, I had a fairly limited understanding of what a foreign policy or an international affairs focused career might look like. Uh, it's in part because of the wonderful faculty classes and internship opportunities I pursued while at G GW that I was able to expand my view of this subject matter and appreciate that there are many career paths available to GW students uh, that can ensure that they make a meaningful contribution to the global community. As an international trade practitioner, I view business and finance as important because they spur global innovation and foster collaboration and economic development on a scale not otherwise achievable. 
International business and finance are not just an academic or professional interest of mine, but they are also an area that my family has been involved in for many years. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the Wenger Family Lecture Series on International Business and Finance. Uh, my great-grandfather, Henry Wenger, for whom uh, the lecture series is named, was an international businessman who worked in the financial sector in his native Switzerland before pursuing uh, related professional opportunities in Europe and the United States. He worked with companies that sought to expand their global footprint and amongst other things, facilitated the raising of capital to expand a uh, company's uh, business strategy. My father's um, business experience led him to found the Aurora Oil Company, which became very successful and for which this uh, lecture is, is uh, the result of. Um, <laughs> he, held, <laughs> he held education to be paramount in the pursuit of self-improvement. And to him, education and apprenticeships involving international finance served as catalysts for his many successes. On behalf of my family, I hope the Wenger Family Lecture Series will serve as a platform for thought-provoking dialogue and a catalyst for exciting new academic and professional pursuits by the GW community in areas of global business and finance, and that it may provide GW students a unique perspective on what a career in international affairs may look like. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today fellow Elliott School alumnus, James Quigley, a 40-year veteran of Wall Street. Jim is a managing director and was named executive vice chairman of international corporate and investment banking at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in 2010. He is responsible for enhancing the firm's relationships with key private and public sector issuer clients and international investors globally to ensure delivery of the bank's full capabilities across asset classes and product sets. Previously, he was president of Bank of America Merrill Lynch's Latin America Group and managed all activities of the broader institution within the region. Prior to Bank of America and Merrill Lynch's merger, Jim was vice chairman of Merrill Lynch & Co, executive chairman of Merrill Lynch International and head of Latin America Global Markets and Investment Banking. Since joining Merrill Lynch in January 1983, he has held many other senior positions. Importantly, over the last 20 years, Jim has generously given back to the Elliott School. He served on the school's Board of Advisors for 12 years from 2000 to 2008 and 2014 to 2018. And currently he sits on the executive circle for the Institute for International Economic Policy. I'm also pleased to introduce our moderator, Dean Alyssa Ayers, who joined the Elliott School this past February. She's also Professor of History and International Affairs at GW. Dean Ayers is a foreign policy practitioner and an award-winning author with senior experience in government, nonprofit, and private sectors. Her work focuses primarily on India's role in the world and on U.S. relations with South Asia in the larger Indo-Pacific. From 2013 to 2021, she was Senior Fellow for India, Pakistan, and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations, where she remains an Adjunct Senior Fellow. From 2010 to 2013, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia. And before serving in the Obama administration, she was Founding Director of the India and South Asia Practice at McLarty Associates from 2008 to 2010. Dean Ayers is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a member of the Halifax International Security Forum's Agenda Working Group, and a member of the Women's Foreign Policy Group Board of Directors. Thank you both for helping me kick off the Wenger Family Lecture Series at my alma mater. Dean Ayers, please take it away. Great, thank you, Leslie. We're just gonna walk up here. Uh, we'll, we'll take our seats here. It's a little bit hard to get a full six feet away. I think we're going to keep our masks on for this. Uh, masks on everywhere, I guess. It's the world we live in. Um, but thank you so much, Wellesley. And, and let me also echo Vice Dean Foster's thanks to the uh, Henry E. and Consuelo S. Wenger Foundation. Thank you to Caprice Wenger Bond and Mark Bond for uh, doing all the work to create the 
uh, newly endowed Wenger family lecture. I'm personally very excited about this because I love the idea of showcasing the many different paths that an Elliott School International Affairs Education can offer students. And one important such path is thinking about international business and finance. So I'm very, very happy to be able to uh, hear today from Jim Quigley. He's going to talk with us, as you heard, about his journey from the Elliott School to Wall Street. If I may, um, I'd actually like you to help set the stage a little bit. Um, when you work internationally with CEOs, with heads of government, with finance ministers, what's on their agenda? What are the sort of top two or three issues that you hear about these days? Thank you, Alyssa. I need to use this. Okay. <laughs> If it was, uh, see, You're on. Yeah. as my family will tell you, I'm the farthest thing from a technologist, so on off is about as sophisticated as I get. Um, if it was two or three things, my job would be a lot easier. <laughs> so this is, uh, I mean, we've just come through a remarkably complex period of time that none of us have seen in our lifetimes. And it just so happens that this is only 10, 12 years removed from my financial crisis that none of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. So you put those two things together and the compound effect on the psyche of C-suite clients globally is very meaningful. Uh, and it's not two or three things, it's a litany of things. And the world will be, you know, I don't think it's an, it's an overstatement to suggest the world will be different going forward. <clears throat> I'd say the first, the, first, the first observation from CEOs having lived through the financial crisis and then having to, dealt, to deal with the fact that they wrapped themselves in Darwinian survival instincts in 2020, borrowing much more money than most companies needed in the public capital markets, because frankly, nobody knew how much money they would need to navigate uh, an unprecedented global pandemic. Um, clients, uh, CEOs are very uh, focused on these types of black swan risks. I think the, one of the biggest impacts is CEOs getting more involved in capital structure management at their respective companies. I mean, normally you'd leave fundraising and capital structure strategy to a CFO, a head of strategy. But the biggest impact I've seen in the public capital markets in the last 18 months has been a massive uh, extension of duration in terms of liability management, i.e. to simplify, companies are raising more 30, 40, 50 year debt than five, seven or 10, 10 year debt. Lots of companies are structuring really innovative, long duration hybrid capital instruments that are structured in a way to give them to be ratings additive with rating agencies and give them some equity credit because they're trying in every way that they can to reinforce the resilience in their respective capital structures so that if and when they have to deal with something like this again, they've at least made an effort to be prepared. In fairness to them, when you look out beyond 2022, which is generally difficult for most people to do, but you know, we're trained to think in that dimension, is you know, you go back to 1997 when we had the synchronized global debt crisis, which was triggered by a innocuous currency devaluation in Thailand that spread the capital controls in Malaysia, a debt downgrade in Korea, and the collapse of long-term capital management and uh, create that synchronized debt crisis almost put the world on the precipice of a, uh, of a depression, to be honest. And had it not been for Wall Street firms to aggregate their balance sheets and recapitalize long-term capital management, that is arguably where we were headed. <clears throat> you know, debt to GDP globally back then was about 200%. And debt to GDP globally in a couple of years in public sector is gonna be north of 400%. So the debt dynamics of the world are pretty scary. We actually have a pretty positive view on private sector balance sheets for a lot of reasons I don't have to bore you with, but public sector balance sheets are deteriorating, right? The, the US itself is 103% debt to GDP today. The previous high in the history of the country, I think was 106% coming out of the Second World War. And assuming President Biden gets half of what he's asking for and spends it, will be 114% by August and the rating agencies, I think, will be forced by the end of next year to put the credit worthiness of the US on credit watch for a downgrade yet again. So the biggest impact on the psyche of CEOs has been has been this, right? Is it take advantage of the optionality the capital markets and credit markets are affording you today to, to, reinfo to reinforce resilience in your capital structure 
so that in the next three to four years, if we do hit a major bump in the road, we're prepared. The second thing would be scalability and consolidation. I mean, any of you that took a business or economics course will have learned that larger scale businesses can be more cost efficient, they have more pricing leverage, et cetera. So the, the trend toward consolidation in key strategic industries has an economic rationale to it. I had a lot of CEOs say to me throughout COVID when they were raising 10, 20, $30 billion in the public capital markets because they didn't know what they would need to survive. I said, you know, Jimmy, thank God that I run a $150 billion market cap company. Thank God that we're important enough to the banking industry where securing bilateral lines of bank lending was easier as opposed to harder because of how large we were. And so that's only further accentuated the trend towards size, i.e. bigger is better. We've had, we've had a record year in mergers and acquisitions on Wall Street this year by a very reasonable metric. It will continue into and through December. It's being accentuated by a fear that the regulatory pendulum on consolidation is moving to the left. So it's incentivizing companies to actually expedite consolidation faster. And this notion that bigger is better because um, we can navigate difficult times maybe with less risk uh, is gonna be with us for a long time. Should I continue? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the third one I would say is, um, is digitization. And, and technology, right? Coming through COVID, when you had a hybrid work environment, I mean, when, when you basically tell the entire world to stop doing what they're doing the way they were doing it for 18 months, it would be madness to think everybody would wanna go back and do what they were doing the same way they were doing it before. And that's why they aren't, in part. <clears throat> Companies realized they needed to invest in technology and digitization strategies to build the template for the workforce of the future. So what's happening is technology spend as a component piece to a company's annual capital spending bucket is growing. And so embedded in that greater technology spend is gonna be greater productivity growth over the next couple of years, which I think the markets are underestimating. And when I, when I, I recently did a meeting with a bank in Germany, I know for years called Renton Bank in Frankfurt. I wouldn't be really surprised. I thought any of you heard of it, but it's a German government guaranteed financial institution that facilitates lending in and around the agriculture space. And they're just totally focused on digital agriculture. What can the German government do in terms of lending, fostering and capital investment into satellite systems, anything related to making agriculture more productive? And I give that to you as just one example, but I could give you examples across every industry. So the race toward technology spend and digitization, which is now being compounded by all the press and focus on artificial intelligence and how it can be harnessed, is, is pretty big. I mean, we, you know, artificial intelligence is, is, you know, is a whole different lecture. But we spend, as a firm, about three and a half billion dollars a year in technology, on top of the one plus billion dollars a year we spend in cybersecurity uh, to protect the bank and all of its clients and customers in the thousands of cyber attacks targeted the United States every year. And um, on the technology and digitization spend, you know, we, we've invested in algorithms that actually will allow certain traders and certain asset classes to know what their largest, most sophisticated investor clients may want to do before they know they want to do it, which gives you a pretty remarkable competitive advantage. So deploy, <clears throat> deployment of AI technology spend is not going to stop. Fourthly, I'd say supply chains. <clears throat> you know, you, you all hear about supply chain dislocations when you go to a store. And the person at the store says to you, you better do your Christmas shopping now because in December there's not going to be anything here. Exactly right. And, yeah, and, there, and there is this real world COVID-related supply chain dislocation, but there also is what I've been calling a self-inflicted US-China related supply chain dislocation, where uh, Western boards are being counseled by their respective governments to comprehensively reassess their supply chain and logistics arrangements globally, so as to mitigate China political risk in their global operating footprints. Japan actually is a great point, point in case, case in point. Japan, has two big development banks, DBJ and JBEC, 
<clears throat> JBIC being Japan Bank for International Cooperation. <clears throat> and they've been making below market loans, and in some cases grants to companies in Japan, the government believes was overexposed to China. I have far too much operating footprint in China, given the fact that they in China don't really see eye to eye on many things. And so they're trying to financially incentivize these companies to migrate the higher end strategic manufacturing out of China, not in a dysfunctional way, but over sort of a 10 plus year period of time into other Southeast Asian countries uh, so as to mitigate China risk. And the same thing is going on in the West, in, in, uh, in the US and Western Europe and to a lesser extent in Latin America uh, by virtue of you know, lots of companies reassessing how they do things with a view towards mitigating China political risk. And I don't think that that stops for 10 years. And I think at the end of the day, that will actually prove to be much more lasting and important than the COVID related dislocations. Fifthly, because it's a long list, is you know, coming out of COVID, coming out of COVID, there has been a very, very pronounced and stark differentiation between private sector corporate balance sheets and public sector fiscal dynamics. So our research folks in emerging markets, frontier markets, investment grade, OECD economies have a pretty positive view on balance sheets. I think US corporate balance sheets and capital structures are in the best shape they've been in maybe in my career. The banking system is super liquid, strong, strong balance sheets. Uh, you know, the system is well prepared and so are the balance sheets of emerging market private sector companies. But because of the devastation COVID wrought, particularly on emerging market countries, because there was no linearity to the deployment of COVID vaccines around the world, a lot of these countries, like take Chile, for instance, Chile is a country normally will issue three to $4 billion a year in the public debt market. I think this year they've issued 15, 16 million. And that you can replicate that times many, many countries. So the fiscal houses, of public sector issuers has deteriorated hugely. And that's a long-term risk. And I think out in 23, 24, we're gonna be talking about debt sustainability and financial market stability in large part because of that. Um, I mean, there are, there are a whole, whole many others, but maybe I'll stop there so you don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> Not at all, that was fascinating. I, I wanna follow up on one thing before we circle back and go into a little bit more depth on uh, the five issues that you mentioned. Um, I know that you have been concerned with the question of climate change. Where does this fit as you see it in, in, in what you hear from the C-suite? Conference of parties meeting right now in Glasgow. Yes, this is, um, this is a top two to three issue with every board and every country and every industry, as it should be. Our CEO, Brian Moynihan, was very visionary 10 years ago when he asked his businesses to focus on this issue before it really became a topical issue. So we've been fortunate enough the last 10 years to be the leading underwriter of, of green bonds, We've helped write the governance structures and metrics around all of these things, working with the United Nations. Ryan's been in Glasgow. He has, as a CEO, really led the charge to make sure the financial sector steps up and in a functional way, tries to help provide a roadmap to all of our clients on the topic of energy transition, which is the way to look at it. But it varies. The anxiety level now globally is picking up because as I've been saying to people for the last couple of years, it's not been that difficult to issue a green bond uh, or a climate friendly bond or a sustainability related financing. It's not been that difficult to put it in your annual report or to say you're in favor of decarbonization or even being adventurous enough to put out there a finite target of decarbonization, climate footprint, right, carbon footprint. But now coming out of Glasgow, I think that there is a recognition in boards all over the world that Pandora's box has been opened. Irrespective of the midterm election outcome next November, um, it, it, we're not going to put the genie back in the bottle. And private sector CEOs are correctly going to step up and continue to do the right thing. So if you're a mid-cap oil and energy producer in Calgary, Canada, you're panicked because you wake up every day wondering whether that's the day 
you have to completely turn your operating model on its head. If you're a larger, more agile, multinational company, you're looking on the margin to divest dirty assets and buy renewables assets to balance out your business model in a manner consistent with being a green friendly company. We just did a deal in Japan where we sold a company called Japan Renewable Energy, which was actually a Goldman Sachs private equity portfolio company to a quote unquote dirty energy Japanese company who was basically buying the asset to balance out their portfolio. You talk to CEOs of lithium, manganese, iron ore producers in Australia, and it's all about this topic. How quickly do we have to move? How much leeway do we have? What is it going to cost? And you know, if I, if I amalgamate all the conversations I've had with so many different companies across different industries, it's likely going to cost more than we think it's going to cost. And, and clients need time. Like I get asked the question all the time, you know, how does the Bank of America deal with its energy clients? You know, and I get it. If you're a, you know, if you're on the progressive left and you have tunnel vision on this topic, which lots of people do, I'll get hit over the head, you know, why do you, why do you lend money to that big $200 billion oil company? Well, if the banks pull their liquidity lines from all these companies on day one, we're going to have a lot of problems. So what we do is we work, and it's pretty labor intensive. You have to work with the boards and management teams of all these clients to make sure that they recognize there's an issue, recognize they need to do something about it, and recognize there needs to be an actionable, definable, transparent, publicly communicated strategy to get from point A to point B. And that helps you manage your clients through the energy transition. Now, there will be clients who will have to turn their business models completely on their head. And a lot of the M&A activity that I see going into next year is being driven by what Alyssa just referred to, is this was, is sort of adapting to the energy transition. So the demand for EV battery type properties, lithium properties, uh, renewable assets, uh, wind turbine, wind farms, and this type of, this is, a, there's gonna be a pretty significant bid for these assets on a sustained basis, I think. For, for this reason. So it is, um, if, you look at, if you look at the growth, the last two years because of COVID, we've seen the biggest growth in issuance, issuance of investment grade and high yield bonds in the history of the capital market. Never before have we had this much issuance. Within the market itself, the fastest growing vertical by a huge metric has been sustainability linked product. I was actually talking to the International Finance Corp on on, Pen on Pennsylvania Avenue last week because they grade their bank relationships every year. And they currently, 10% of their grade is how we uh, move the ball forward on ESG, right? Environmental social governance. And that's a, that may become 20% next year. You talk to the CEO of a Japanese bank, every one of them will tell you that they're under pressure to work with every lending client of the bank to make sure they're doing the things our clients are doing in the US. Now, so when you're Bank of America and you have an active financial relationship with 34 plus percent of all the small to mid cap businesses in the country, and you have a lending or banking relationship with 98% of the S&P 1000, it's a lot of work across those industries, but you know the banks are very committed to doing it. We are very committed to doing it. It feels to me like there is no questioning across the client base that they need to do it or get to a point where they do it. So that was just a question of how quickly we can move without creating dysfunction uh, in industry. Let me follow up on a, another geopolitical piece that you mentioned um, when you spoke about supply chain. You also referenced uh, the challenges in the U.S.-China relationship. How does the, the U.S.-China piece China's rise, China geopolitical sets of issues. How is that perceived on Wall Street? Wes is trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> I, I most certainly this am is, not. This is how she does it. She's very subtle. What I'm, trying, <laughs> what I'm trying to do is illustrate how important a geopolitical background is for a career in finance. Right. Uh, well, that's a different question. <laughs> but I am gleefully going to take your first question. 
because it's something I've been focused on for years. So look, we're a global investment bank. We have an obligation to all of our clients to help them. China is the world's second largest economy. We don't have a private banking business in China. We don't have a consumer business in China. We just announced we were going to apply for a license to open a broker dealer in China. We will be one of the last US banks to do that. Our business is fundamentally institutional wholesale investment banking, cross border equity IPOs, secondary, secondary equity deals, raising debt, cross border MA. That's been predominantly our, our business. So the question, I mean, the real question to ask is given the configuration of the world today with the risks we see going forward, are the strategies, interests, and priorities of the US banking system properly aligned with the strategic objectives of the country within which they are domiciled? And it depends on, on the bank. I, mean, I think I have a view of, on this topic based on 40 years of experience where you know, we were talking earlier today, I think you know the Obama administration had a view that they wanted to bring China into the global financial community, the global economic trade financial community, offer Chinese folks big positions of authority on a bunch of multilateral development banks, bring them into the World Trade Organization, do a lot of things based on the theory that once you did that, you would be able to elicit a type of behavior that was perhaps on the margin more user friendly. That has not happened. My view has always been that that was never going to happen. So the Chinese, um, you know, as, as Obama in the last two years of his second term, and Biden knows this, and as Trump, who I think had some good instincts, but an inability to translate good instincts into actionable, functional policy. And as Biden today are seeing, if you peel back the onion on China's activities around the world, you find bad behavior. And this is not the right forum for me to run through a litany of that. But I could tell you stories very close to home in Washington, DC, where you would, uh, you would, you would not be shaking your head no. So the issue is, you know, what do we do about it? And um, I, I think I have it upon reasonably good authority, although, you know, it's Washington, D.C., so anything can happen. I think there's a reasonable chance that the president and his team are of the view, believe it or not, that they're going to turn the heat up on the Chinese leadership in the earlier first half part of next year, whether that's via an aggressive expansion of the entity list or however they decide to do it, based on the supposition that Xi is weak. And if pressured, we will elicit the right behavior. Now, the Chinese financial system is a mess. Uh, it's hard to prove because they are very insufficiently transparent on anything. And they will tell you, I went to China three years ago and I met the CEOs of the big four financial firms that were set up by the government to manage all the non-performing loans in the country, one of which was Huarong Securities, and you know what's happened to them. Every time I would ask a CEO the question, what is the size, the aggregate size of NPLs in China in separate meetings, the response I would get would be boisterous laughter in my face, and then, oh, of course, four trillion renminbi. But the IMF thinks it's 12, and the White House is being told by our intelligence community, amongst others, that it's 14. And when I was in Australia last January, right before COVID really took off, and, and the Chinese knew more about it than we did at the time, I got a call from somebody who told me there was evidence that Chinese were moving all these NPLs around the totality of the financial system. So not only do we know how, mu how much there is, we don't really know where it is. The other thing is the real estate sector. I mean, for those of you that you know, have Chinese friends or work with Chinese folks, uh, real estate is, I think, the number one investment theme amongst all the Chinese I've known in my career. I mean, a lot of Chinese folks who would get paid their bonuses every year, they go out and buy another apartment in London or another, I mean, they just collect real estate the way we would collect baseball cards as kids. <clears throat> I think the baseball cards are worth more money today. And, and so you have a 
very fragile real estate sector, which has been a real engine of growth for the Chinese economy. We just came out with a report two weeks ago downgrading fiscal year 2022 nominal GDP in China to 4.0%, which would be the lowest in well over 20 years. And I don't know, as Mike and I have had this conversation before, I don't know what the equilibrium level of nominal GDP in China is below which the country can no longer absorb all the new workers coming into the workforce in the urban center from the rural parts of the country. But I would bet you it's around 4%. And we think there's downside to that. And Xi is up for reappointment next November, which I view as a profound oxymoron because they just said he was president for life, but I guess a president for life has to be up for renomination. So the view is that Xi has got his hands full. And if we pressure him, we'll elicit good behavior. My fear is that when the CCP gets its back to a wall, they've proven to be incredibly effective at exercising a call option on Chinese nationalism. The example I would give is um, I was in Tokyo during the World Bank meeting years ago when China and Japan hit the apex on the issue over the Shinkanku Islands. And a few weeks later, I was talking to the CEO of Toyota. He told me Toyota car sales in China like stopped within a week, went to, went to near zero. It's, it's amazing how the Chinese can exercise a call option on consumer behavior when they decide they want to. And you have sort of, I don't, I don't know what to call it, but there is sort of this hybrid cultural revolution of sorts going on there now, all really built around data. Because you know, I think the future, I did a call this morning before I came here with one of our head of thematic investing, I am Israel, who's brilliant. And you know, everything is about data. And so the Chinese are bringing a lot of their data-related companies. They want to relist them in Hong Kong. Western companies are bringing data centers out of China to other countries. And this data revolution and the, and the, and the walls, the iron curtains going up on data, I think are, are really relevant. So I see, you know, I had hoped, but Henry Kissinger once told people at CSIS that he advised Trump at Mira Lago before he was sworn in, that he always believed China would be a totalitarian state but would ultimately over time migrate to the Lee Kuan Yew model in Singapore, but that didn't happen. And Trump was asked to tweak relations with China, which emphasizes the point, always know your audience, because I don't think Trump knew the meaning of the word tweak. <laughs> but I was in China a week after Trump visited China within a year of his inauguration and signed $200 billion of trade deals. And I spent a week visiting clients, you know, flags, guys with guns, people in the background with no teeth taking notes furiously, and um, who are usually the ones that make the decisions. And everybody was delivering me the message, Trump, we can work with him. He's a businessman. This is great. The word from Xi is triple down on foreign direct investment. I went to one place where somebody had leather bound books on a table, and they were talking about uh, asking for Bank of America's help in buying assets. I said, well, assets for what? Well, we're gonna create this multi-billion dollar private equity fund called the China-US Agricultural Friendship Fund. I said, okay, what are you gonna buy? US farmland in Iowa and Illinois, agricultural technology, satellite. I said, hey, listen, I said, let me just tell you something. So I, I, as, as people here know, you get the unfiltered, unsanitized version of the world from me because there's only one truth and then there's a lot of bullshit. <laughs> and the truth is, the truth is they were never going to get anything. Trump completely pulled the wool over their eyes. But they actually thought they were going to go into the US and buy farmland in Iowa. And I had to tell them they weren't going to buy a bubble gum machine because Cepheus <laughs> was going to be restructured. And within six months, they all wanted me to come back and have dinner with me because I'm probably the one banker that told them the truth. There are bankers squirming in a chair because sometimes the truth hurts. But there were so many instances of the Chinese having two, three, four iteration Trojan horse strategies to buy the assets they wanted around the world. And again, we're not going to have time today, or I'd give you so many examples. And it came to a screeching halt under Trump. So it's terribly tough to, uh, to, um, defend character of the man. The reality is on this particular topic, 
I feel we owe a debt of gratitude because he opened Pandora's box on something that was probably 10 to 20 years too late. And the Biden administration national security team sees it for what it is. I think we can agree the Obama administration got it in the last 18 to 24 months of his second term. And I don't see it changing. So you may see in the next four to five months, uh, optically, the US and China kind of getting along, which is driven by our wanting to engender more collaboration on climate change related issues, even though they didn't go to G20 in Rome or the Glasgow meeting. But the reality is, as we go into the next calendar year, March, April, May, I keep a really close eye on what Obama's White House does vis-a-vis -vis entity list, trade policy with China, and a bunch of other things. It's, um, it's a new world. So with that kind of backdrop tour of the, of the world, let me ask you to switch gears for just a brief moment, and then we'll open it up to questions. Looking back on your career, there's anything that you wish that you had known as you started out, as you graduated from the Elliott School and began your career in international banking and finance, what would that be? What advice would you have for our students? Uh, immediately upon getting married, just learn to say yes to you. <laughs> <laughs> probably the most valuable lesson. Uh, on international affairs, I would say um, the following. I never understood, even when I went to school down here in 78 to 82, dating myself in 61, I never understood why people who came to the Elliott School, including the school, including recruiters, looked at it as an engine of employment for the public sector. And clearly we send a lot of people to the State Department, various forms of government, the UN, whatever, think tanks. And we, but the reality is when I talk to CEOs today, they want nothing to do with a book. They don't want to talk about product push. They don't want me to impress them with the fact that I priced two trillion bonds in my life. And I could talk about the credit markets blindfolded you know, standing on my head. They want, they want somebody in a time efficient manner to bring them the world in an actionable way at the nexus of geostrategy, politics, finance, and economics. That's what they want. That's the conversation they all want to have because everything you're studying here is vastly more relevant to the business world than it was in the 1980s. And that's where I spend my life doing. There's not enough time in the day. I mean, look what Ian Brummer has done with, uh, with his um, Eurasia group or the other sort of modules like that. I mean, they've made a living out of geopolitical advisory to private sector companies because there's an incredible insatiable demand for it as the world shrinks, right? As we all get more interconnected, um, like supply chains, right? I mean, there is... So literally a year ago, 18 months ago, if you talk to the average consumer about supply chains, I mean, their eyes would cross over, but now everybody is a supply chain expert. And, and that's where the world is going. It's a daily life issue. It's a daily life issue. I mean, you walk into a retail store, you can't leave without somebody who knows you grabbing you and say, hey, for Christmas, you better be here in the next two weeks because there's not going to be anything here. You know, I, I walked into an, an air maze shop my local town the other day, and in the section where they always have purses, they had men's shoes. <laughs> so, did you move things around? They said, no, we have no supply. So I think that, that what I would say, my, my experience has been that being in the private sector for 40 years, I, I feel very strongly, I feel with great conviction. I don't feel like I'm lying to myself when I say this. I've been able to do more for my country and more for our financial system and make a bigger difference than I would have made if I was in the public sector in the absence of getting to a job where you can really singularly do those sorts of things. So this notion of public-private sector divide is just doesn't make any sense. You know, the, 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 the stuff you're learning, and, and to, to, to Lissa's question, I've been talking for years down here at many, many meetings about creating dual degrees. Because one, one of the problems trying to recruit kids from the Elliott School is a lot of employers, they will think that you don't understand business. You don't understand financial modeling. You're not a computer scientist. 
And in many cases, you're not. You know, I have a son who's watching this right now from New York, who's in his third year at BlackRock. And when he interviewed at BlackRock three years ago, graduating from this school in this building where you are sitting, Larry Fink said, give me a kid who knows how the world works because we can teach him how the financial markets work. I think that's a simple observation, but very apropos, and that's where the world is going. So I think with the Elliott School and the Business School and the Milken Institute, what GW University needs to do is the Elliott School shouldn't be viewed in a silo. I mean, there are people that will come here in a silo and they really want to be in the State Department for their whole life, and that's great. But I think to create a dynamic where one plus one equals three, which is what we should be thinking down here, you want to bring these programs together. Because if I go to a Wall Street bank and I say, I've got a kid who's got, who's got a great resume and a great grade point average and has a great grounded education in international strategic studies. And by the way, they did a joint degree in international business and economics. That makes a difference. And I'm surprised at how few kids in GW are taking advantage of these joint degree programs. They're relevant and they matter and they make it easier to push this student body into Wall Street. So I think um, the world is changing in a way which is gonna open up many more avenues for graduates of this school than it was the case when I came out of it in 1982 and count on that and challenge yourself in that regard. You know, I couldn't write a computer program if my life depended on it. My kids know it, my bank knows it, and I was not a math whiz. But you, you know, when you figure out how the world works and you can connect the dots, and so you're always three to six months ahead of everybody else in the way you think and advise clients, that in today's world is much more relevant than knowing that one plus one is two. Um, we'll take some questions from our in-person community, and then we will take some questions from our online community. Elaine, can you tell us how we're going to do the questions here? Yes, just like that. If you're in person, please make sure that you wait for the microphone to come to you so that the people online can hear what you're asking. And I will just comment that Martin Burville, who is on our board of advisors currently, he's a parent of an Ellie School student. He said, bravo to everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> questions I'll, here. Tell them to sign the check. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? We have one online. If, if you are formulating, we'll start online. We'll start online. So what role do you think Europe can play in the future global economy, given the increasing focus on the U.S.-Chinese relationship? Every one of these questions I could go on for 30 minutes. <laughs> we haven't talked about it. It's so funny. In today's world, it's all about U.S. and China. It's amazing we don't talk about Europe. So I would say two things about Europe. One uh, that worries me and one that's very positive. What's worried me about Europe, as all of you in this room will know better than most students in the country, is you know the 1957 Treaty of Rome, the European Coal and Steel Community, the whole notion of Europe is basically created to limit nationalism and eliminate war, basically. And uh, the European currency is basically a big red bow on the box to tie everybody together. And I spent, and I, I grew up in Europe actually, I grew up in France. Uh, my dad was with IBM, so I have a real affinity for France. I've lived in London five times, I know it really well. Um, I'd argue with European clients for years. I'd say, you know, I said, before Europe, the French would take out their frustrations on North African immigrants, the Germans on Turkish immigrants, the Spanish on the Basques, the British on the Irish, there were just dozens of outlets to vent frustration. But I said, when you have this remarkable experiment and socioeconomic political experiment, and you put everybody in a box and you tie it together with one currency, you better damn well be prepared, using an American football analogy, to take the ball from your 20, line, your 20 yard line into the end zone, and then you win. And then you do something really special. And they would say, no, so what's happened? I said, well, what's happened is you took the ball to the 50-yard line and you declared timeout for 20 years. <laughs> and that doesn't work. And what's going to happen is a lot of rigidity is going to be created in the system. 
and the, and the lesser well-off countries are going to be strapped with a currency that's stronger than they would ordinarily have because of the strength of the Deutsche Mark. And the Germans are going to be strapped with a currency that would be automatically uh, lower in value than the Deutsche Mark. They would prosper, and the weaker countries, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, would go through this cathartic crisis that was accentuated by the financial crisis. And I said, in that scenario, people are going to take their frustrations out on the box, out on the construct you created because you didn't go into the end zone. And so instead of eliminating nationalism, you're going to facilitate a resurgence of, um, what's the right word, uh, of nationalism, right? of populism, which is what we've seen happen in Europe. So if we woke up tomorrow and the front page of the Financial Times read that European political elites, bureaucrats, corporate CEOs, regulators, everybody is now woke up and magically they realize it's in their best interest to focus on building and nurturing European corporate champions versus protecting archaically organized national champions, Europe would be way ahead of the game. Europe is not in that place yet. And, and that is primarily what holds them back in my view. And I've had this argument with very senior people in the European Union. And it's actually very fun to have because it is. <laughs> and um, on, the, on the positive side, I'd say this. In the new world of renewable energy, and clean energy and ESG, Europe is actually really well positioned. I think eight of the 11 largest cap companies in the world who are best in class in this space are European. And the European corporate Europe, the mindset of the consumer and the population, public sector policy, I'd say is pretty far ahead of where we are in this space. And there is an opportunity for Europe to compensate somewhat for the inefficiencies of what they did, which I talked about, outlined in that space. And that could, you know, we have a, we have, we have a more favorable equity investment view of Europe looking into next year in both small to mid cap and large cap companies. Um, but the debt dynamics in Europe are poor, right? In Italy and other countries. And eventually they're gonna to have to take the ball into the end zone. Eventually, they're gonna to have to give up the ghost on nationalism. Eventually, when we show ideas about merging this company in Italy and this company in France, there shouldn't be any questions, stupid questions, like where is the headquarters? Who's the CEO? Where are the job losses coming from? If one plus one can be made to equal three, Europe needs to do that a thousand times. Zoe, can you just introduce yourself? Hi, um, my name is Zoe. I'm a senior in the Elliott School studying international economics and business. Um, and I was really interested by the points that you made on what is on the mind of CEOs. And I was interested that you left out cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So I was wondering, like, how is Wall Street thinking about that now? And how is that going to revolutionize like the financial system within the next five to 10 years? So in fairness to the audience, we should let all of you know in an effort of consummate transparency that I didn't meet Zoe in lunch earlier today. She introduced herself and said, oh, Mr. Creamy, my name is Zoe. I'm going to work on the derivative desk at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> but I want you to know I'm a nice guy. So despite that, I'm going to answer her question. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Good luck and good move. Congratulations. So cryptocurrencies. Um, again, I'm going to give you my view, right? My view. Uh, my view is I remember a meeting in Tokyo maybe two, two and a half years ago with Sun San, who runs uh, SoftBank. And he was asking about cryptocurrencies. And I said, Look, I said, I have an issue buying something that with the flip of a pen, a regulator can render worthless in a minute. I can't get my head around. That I mean, I can get my head around the blockchain technology and the application of blockchain technology and the intersection of blockchain technology and fintech and its impact on financial services. And I think there's a lot of ways to invest in that. But I have, I have never had any exposure to cryptocurrencies. I don't have any. Clearly, that's been wrong. Clearly, I've left a lot of money on the table. So 
if you have cryptocurrencies today is the fob, and I don't have any, I don't have any material non-public information into what the SEC or any regulatory body is going to do, but I've sort of come around to this conclusion. It's going to be aggressively regulated. I don't know what the implication of that will be for the pricing structure. My conclusion is that once the government puts in place guideposts, regulatory guideposts, that may really serve to legitimatize cryptocurrency to some degree if they stop short of wiping it out. So we were a bit late to the party. I mean, we're very, uh, and I think we're right. I think our firm is very right. We have $3.7 trillion of exclusively US high net worth private banking assets between Merrill Lynch and Bank of America Trust. And we are really uh, disciplined and cautious and probably conservative about what we allow our clients to buy and do. You now, a caveat emptor dominates all those conversations. Suitability is a big, big issue, especially coming out of the financial crisis. And there's been tremendous demand, believe me, from the clients and from the financial advisors to offer these products. So we've recently um, come out with really excellent research on sort of digital currencies and crypto in general. So there's a research part of it. There's a trading desk part of it. Uh, and we're very gradually allowing certain strata of the high net worth, we're entertaining, allowing them to get involved in it. But it's hard to handicap. It's very hard to, to handicap because, you know, my view in the beginning was that if the US and the UK and the European Union, if they could have outlawed cryptocurrency at some point, I think they would have. And I actually think what held them back is the desire not to leave des the designing of the governance structure of cryptocurrencies to the Chinese, who are talking about developing a central bank digital currency. The Chinese then came out very much opposed to cryptocurrencies, but maintaining a focus on central bank digital currencies for a lot of reasons. I think in large part to drive acceptability of the renminbi as a global reserve currency longer term for economic strategy reasons. Uh, so once the Chinese walked away and they started kicking out all the Bitcoin miners and doing all the things you're all familiar with, and I think the Western regulators had kind of a monkey taken off their back. And uh, it, it, it gave them some more discretion and authorship over how they were gonna approach this longer term. So I don't know what they're going to do, and I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I know that I've created a massive financial opportunity cost by not jumping into the space very early on. Um, but I, I don't know. I do get, I do get asked that question. I say Development Bank, Development Bank of Singapore is a big client of ours. And every time I talk to the CEO and the CFO, this comes up because DBS stepped up about a year or so ago, maybe longer, and sponsored the creation of a digital currency exchange in Singapore. So that Singapore could kind of be the marquee financial center for this in Southeast Asia. Um, so there is a lot of focus on it and there's a highly polarized, viscerally polarized debate. And there are clients who, who very smart clients who with great conviction feel they wouldn't go near it. And there are clients who absolutely believe it's the future. And I don't know the answer. Lane, do you think we can do one work? I saw some hands yeah. over here. Okay, we'll take one more. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Blanks. I graduated from Elliott School last spring. I'm now currently a presidential fellow um, in the business school, um, pursuing my master's business administration. And so I recognized throughout my time here, and like you put a point to, there's a lot of lack of recognition of the value of international affairs in the business world. People don't really know what it is, they can't pinpoint, or they don't know that they have a business background. And so how do you uh, recommend students really um, build that, that um, validation and credentials to you know, get a job at Goldman Sachs or get a job in the financial market, even if they didn't do a master's or um, a minor in business? You should definitely ask Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> um, there shouldn't be much you have to do to market a degree. I mean, the way the world is today and where it's going, that should be a self-fulfilling prophecy. The kids coming into the program as freshmen, 
I would urge all of them to look at joint degree programs. I really don't understand why they have an aversion to it. It makes tremendous sense. The other thing I'd say, and we talked about this you know, earlier before I came out here in front of all you folks, is the recruiting processes on Wall Street are very, very different than they were you know, 40 years ago. I, they couldn't be more different. You know, for one, you know, compliance departments are much more powerful. Uh, HR departments are much more powerful. Uh, the, the cultures within the institutions, every single one of them, are probably slightly more sterile than they were 30, 40 years ago, with good reason. I mean, the industry didn't really distinguish itself you know, in the financial crisis in many respects. So uh, the recruiting process is one in which you know, there's a very structured recruiting program for kids between their sophomore and junior years of college coming in internship program. The street, our bank as well, and I agree with all of this, has become very, very focused on the whole broad-based issue of diversity and inclusion. Because for many, many years, the street didn't get this right. And you don't wake up one day and realize that your employee demographic doesn't fit the employee demographic of the country. And the solution is not just go hire a thousand people to fix it, because you'll make a lot of mistakes. You gotta start doing a lot of smaller things right and systematizing um, recruiting. So the, the sophomore to junior year is really a DNI year, which gives the firms an ability to familiarize themselves with a high end DNI population. The, the junior to senior year is open to everybody. And lots of people can come in in between whatever and send resumes. But at least the firms now afford them, themselves the ability to get visibility to a much more diverse, recruitable group of people which is helping on the margins solve the DNI issue, which I think is fantastic. But because of the structured nature of the program, you know, say, say you're a senior at Elliott and you've had no contact with a Wall Street bank other than seeing me today. It's harder. It's harder for me. I tried to do it. It's harder to get a senior into the system because the way the system works is they'll recruit first from the DNI summer, second from the next summer. They see a lot of people in between. They have to, you know, vet out and make decisions on. And they've got to be quick and they've got to be agile because it's a very competitive environment. As Zoe, as Zoe knows, we'll make offers to a lot of people, and some will go to J.P. Morgan and Goldman, and they'll make offers to people who will come here or go to City or go to Evercore or, or whatever. So we've got it's got to be there's got to be tremendous agility for the banks and the system. So it's very um, it, it's it's very disciplined and therefore rigid. So it be, it, by definition, it's harder to kind of circumvent the roadmap that the banks create. And I've done it, and it can be done. So what I told the head of your recruiting group earlier this morning in a meeting is uh, who wanted me to meet a bunch of graduate kids is the reality is. You need to talk to your freshmen and orientation, and you need to tell them, hey, out there, anybody who thinks they want to kind of marry an Elliott degree with a business degree and go into the financial services, investment banking, asset management industries, think about it quick and let us know by the end of your freshman year so you, we can plug you into the recruiting folks on Wall Street. And you're, we get in touch with people in their freshman year. So. I don't want to, this isn't meant to discourage anybody because the reality is I have succeeded with juniors and graduate students. And the other thing that's actually working in the favor of students in general, uh, and this is industry-wide, is the highly unusual attrition levels. It's not because the banks are bad. It's not because the cultures are bad. It's not because we're mean, people work too hard. But, you know, for the most part, the millennials I talk to today, Nine out of 10 of them think they can move to whatever city in the country they want to live in and wake up in the morning and work for whatever country they want to work, work for anywhere else in the country. Because technology platforms, hybrid work is making all this possible. So you can't, again, you can't give everybody 18 months off and expect the world going back to be the same. So because of that and a lot of other reasons, there's been abnormally high levels of attrition in the analyst class, the associate class, even the VP class really like double to the plus of what I remember in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And that's creating a situation where banks have to go out and replenish their 
their business with the younger people. So it's actually making it on the margin easier for somebody who's a senior who wants to get in because the holes are being created by virtue of, of this, this attrition, which as I said, is industry-wide, every part of the industry. Uh, I don't know how long that lasts. What I, my advice to the Elliott School would be is to you know, formalize a process whereby which kids who are coming in now on year one, this is something you gotta start thinking about. You don't wait till you graduate because you may run the risk of, of being too late and you may be perfectly qualified. And I've seen situations where it's, it's, it's sad because people are motivated, they're qualified, they've got the skill set, but they just missed, they just missed, you know, being at the right place at the right time because they waited too long. I've got that message. That's an important message. We're going to work on that. Um, thank you, everyone, everyone online, everyone here in person. Thanks for joining us to hear from Jim Quigley. Elliot alum, 40 years experience on Wall Street. Thank you for your insights. I want to also thank uh, the Henry Ian Consuelia Wenger Foundation for setting up this lecture. This is the first of what will be a regular occasion. Let me also thank Wellesley Parker for joining us today uh, and for being such a supporter of what we're trying to do with this lecture. We are looking forward to continuing it. And I hope everyone here will join us next door in the lounge for refreshments. And I hope everyone online will think about coming in person next time to join us for the refreshments. Thank you.